The typewriter, Sweet Caroline, and a Supreme Court judge are all on this day. Welcome back to On This Day. Today's date is June 23rd, 2022. It is the 174th day of the year. We got 191 days left. It is the 25th Thursday in the 26th week and the third day of summer. If today is your birthstone, we're still a pearl or a moonstone. And, of course, your zodiac sign, which just switched, you're a cancer. I may have told this story before, but my mom passed away of cancer. A couple years later, my son was playing Sims. He was a young guy. My wife's sitting behind him, and he's making his character. If you don't know Sims is, it's a video game where you make a person and then go about your life. Well, his date popped up, and... <laughs> My wife goes, oh, he's a cancer, knowing the astrological signs. And my son turns around and goes, oh, no, I just made this character. He's already got cancer. My wife's all, no, no. Anyway, very entertaining. Today is National Hydration Day. National Hydration Day reminds us to replace fluids lost in the heat of battle we call sports. Actually, it's very important in the heat of battle. Actual battle. It's not uncommon for a soldier or a Marine or Navy personnel, whatever they call themselves, to go down from heat exhaustion or something. When I was in Ranger School, I think the first week it was August in Georgia. That wasn't combat, but it was Ranger School. And I think we lost like 12 people to heat cramps and heat exhaustion and all that stuff. Been many years. I remember it was over 10 and under 20. The human body contains more than 60% water. Maintaining that balance while training is a challenge, and doing it during the summer months is a practice that must be consistent. Becoming overheated or dehydrated can lead to heat stroke and possibly death, or Sam Kennison. So one of the guys that went down with heat exhaustion while I was in the army, his whole stomach and his body's cramping up and the medics are taking care of him and he starts screaming just like that old comedian Sam Kennison, like, oh my God, what is happening to me? What is going on here? He sounded just like him. And one of the guys goes, he doesn't have heat exhaustion. He has Sam Kennison. It was funny. All right, let's see what else June 23rd has given us. 1810, John Jacob Astor forms the Pacific Fur Company. 1860, the United States Congress establishes the Government Printing Office. Didn't know it was a thing. 1865, the American Civil War. At Fort Townsend in the Oklahoma Territory, Confederate Brigadier General Stan Waddy surrenders the last significant Confederate Army. 1868, Christopher Latham Scholes receives a patent for an invention he called the typewriter. There's another industry that got killed by the computer. I watched this really neat video one time on YouTube years ago about industries that have been killed by technology and like the milkman. That used to be a very common thing, but then the refrigerator came along and they didn't need milk deliveries every other day or whatever. There also used to be guys in New York that would go down the street with a cart and all the women would come outside and get all their knives sharpened or whatever. And then the, the kitchen knives they have now most of the time don't need to be sharpened. Neither do your scissors. I think right now we're at the beginning, but we're watching the end of cable television and uh, like oil change places. As more cars become electric, less need for oil change places on every corner. That'll probably be another 25 years before we really start to see a dent in that one. But I think it's heading that way. 1887, the Rocky Mountain Park Act becomes law in Canada, creating the nation's first national park, Banff National Park. 1916, in a game against the Washington Senators, Boston Red Sox pitcher Ernie Shores retires 26 batters in a row after replacing Babe Ruth, who had been ejected for punching an umpire. Boy, how things have changed. That guy would be banned for the rest of the year and maybe several years or his whole career for punching an umpire. I remember years ago, a player was hit in the eye. The referees in football have a yellow flag that they throw when there's penalty and they weigh them down with like little lead weights or BBs or whatever. So they stay where they throw them. They don't float around. The referee threw it at a penalty and hit this guy named Orlando Brown in the eye. Caused some damage. He was pissed when the referee went over to see how he was doing and apologized right afterwards. He shoved him to the ground. He got suspended for that season, but it wouldn't have mattered. He was out of football for three years because of the eye injury. It was that bad. Even though he was injured and it was an accident and all that, you still got to take the suspension. You can't be doing that. 1938, the Civil Aeronautics Act is signed into law, forming the Civil Aeronautics Authority in the United States. 1960, the United States Food and Drug Administration declares Enovid to be the first officially approved combined oral contraceptive pill in the world. Yes, this was the pill. Came out in 1960. 
while researching this, I found out that they now have it as a nasal spray or they're testing it as a nasal spray. 1972, Title IX of the United States Civil Rights Act of 1964 is amended to prohibit sexual discrimination to any educational program receiving federal funds. 1912, Ashton Eaton breaks the decathlon world record at the United States Olympic Trials. 2018, 12 boys and an assistant coach from a soccer team in Thailand are trapped in a flooding cave, leading to an eight-day rescue operation. This was an amazing story, and it caught worldwide attention. Apparently, the assistant coach and the boys after soccer practice decided they were going to go explore some caves that these weren't just, you know, out of the way caves. This was kind of like a tourist attraction. And they rode their bikes there, parked their bikes outside, and then no one heard from them again. The rain started and they got trapped inside the caves. Most people thought they were dead, but they went to look for them since basically they thought the boys would have washed out by now or something like that if they were dead. Well, they never turned up. So a rescue effort started where they sent divers in to try and look for these boys. The cave was huge and had a lot of twists and turns. Efforts to locate the boys were hampered by rising water levels and strong currents. No contact was made for nearly two weeks. On July 2nd, after advancing through a narrow passage in muddy waters, a couple British divers found the group alive on an elevated rock about 4 kilometers, 2.5 miles, from the cave mouth. Now that they found them and could possibly get supplies to them, their next thing was, how do we get these boys out of here? It was monsoon season, the water levels weren't going down anytime soon, they were kind of in a pickle. They came up with a few different plans. Drill a hole to the boys and bring them out through the hole. Teach them how to dive with scuba gear and have them swim out with the aid of other divers. Or they leave them in there for a few months until the water subsides when the monsoon season is over. They had a few obstacles. One, if they waited too long, the water could continue to rise and they could actually drown. If they're going to teach them how to dive, I mean, that's dangerous. Diving normally is dangerous, especially if you're trying to teach someone in a hurry. But diving in a cave, that's dangerous for people that have been doing it for a very long time and professionals. So much so that two of the divers that went in there actually died. One actually died in the cave and one died from a blood infection he received during the operation. It was like a year later, though. The rescue effort involved 10,000 people, 100 divers, scores of rescue workers, representatives from 100 governmental agencies, 900 police officers, 2,000 soldiers, 10 police helicopters, 7 ambulances, and more than 700 diving cylinders. And pumps they used to try and pump out the cave. They were pumping more than a billion liters of water from the caves. On July 8th, the rescue began. The first part of the extraction, 18 rescue divers, consisting of 13 international cave divers and five from the Thai Navy SEALs, were sent into the caves to retrieve the boys. One diver would accompany each boy on the dive out. What I found interesting was how they decided who would be rescued first. They kind of left it up to the boys who would go out first, and the boys got down together and decided that those who lived the furthest from the cave would go first because they still had in their mind they would be riding their bicycles home, and they had a further way to go so they can get out first. They all spent weeks in the hospital. So the rescue went down like this. The boys were fitted with a wetsuit, a buoyancy jacket, a harness, and a positive pressure full mask. A cylinder with 80% oxygen was clipped to the front of them, and they were tethered to their diver because of poor visibility. They were then given ketamine, which rendered them unconscious so they wouldn't panic on the journey out of the cave. This was only supposed to last for 45 minutes to an hour, and it, that's about how long they expected the trip out to take, but if it took longer, the diver could administer more and knock them out again. After a short dive, the single diver would deliver them to a few other divers in a dry area where they would continue the rest of the way. In the end, all the boys were rescued and the assistant coach. The group only suffered minor scrapes and cuts, mild rashes, and lung inflammation. That was it, and they all survived. Released on June 23rd, I think this is a first, a song, 1969, Sweet Caroline, written and recorded by Neil Diamond. The popular single reached number four on the Billboard Hot 100. It became a fixture at sporting events, weddings, and celebrations. If you want to feel good about humanity, type in Sweet Caroline College Football. And there are a lot of, well, not a lot, there's a few football stadiums where at like halftime or whatever, the whole stadium sings Sweet Caroline. 
I watched it a few times during the pandemic because I kind of missed being at settings like that where you could experience something in group settings. And it kind of it actually made me miss going to things like that. If you get a chance, watch that. It's pretty interesting. The song was originally released with the title Sweet Caroline. Good times never seem so good. Uh, Diamond once said the inspiration for the song was John F. Kennedy's daughter, Caroline Kennedy, but later said it was also about his then wife, Marsha. Born on June 23rd, 1948, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. He's the second African-American to serve on the Supreme Court. He was a firm believer in the Constitutionist view of the U.S. Constitution. He was released from military duty because he failed his medical exam. He was almost prevented from being a Supreme Court judge because of allegations of sexual harassment made by attorney Anita Hill. I remember those hearings. They were horrible. Now, both political parties do this. I mean, they tore Bill Clinton through the ringer. We, we got the Brett Kavanaugh thing. You had the Benghazi thing. All that stuff just happens. It's part of the political process, I guess you could say. It's too bad, too. I mean, both parties do it, and it sucks. There's conspiracy theories or just rumors, maybe urban legend, that that's why Clarence Thomas is so anti-Democrat, because he was put through the ringer during his Supreme Court hearings. And now his wife's getting called to the January 6th thing. The whole thing's a mess. His current wife, the one that's being called Virginia Lamp was her name, uh, that's his second wife. Died on June 23rd, 2017, Gabe Pressman, famous as a pioneer of American broadcast journalism. Pressman had over a six-decade career with WNBC and won numerous Emmy Awards. At one point in his career, he served as the president of the New York Press Club. After earning his bachelor degree from New York University, he attended Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. He fought in World War II and worked as a newspaper and radio reporter before beginning his television career in the mid-1950s. Some of his more famous interviews were President Harry S. Truman, Marilyn Monroe, and Fidel Castro. He died of natural causes at Mount Sinai Hospital in Manhattan on June 23, 2017 at the age of 93. All right, that's today's video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got some information out of it. Now go out, have a productive day, and be nice to each other.